Mr. Leahy. Senator Patrick Leahy, and I'd also like to welcome those that are watching on live streaming from our friends at Orca. I had an email this morning from an old Liberty Street neighbor, Norma, and Norma should be watching from Colorado, and we hope uh, many others watching from around the country. I'd also like to introduce uh, some other Leahy's that are here. Jane Leahy, the Senator's sister-in-law. Mary Leahy, the Senator's sister. And, sister. and Marcel Leahy, soulmate, spouse, and uh, co-conspirator for 61 years. One other person I want to introduce is Maxine Leary, who was a senator's teacher. Maxine, stand up and wave to the crowd. <laughs> Chemistry and sociology. Is that right? Chemistry and sociology. There you go. Wonderful. Acting as moderator today is Diane Derby. Diane <laughs> served for six years as press secretary to Senator Jeffords. Can you turn the mic off? Sure. I guess I can talk louder. Yeah, talk louder. And uh, 10 years, and Diane served for 10 years for Senator Leahy as his local representative out of the Montpelier office. And we all know her now as senior editor at Vermont Digger. So we want to welcome Diane as our moderator. And uh, <laughs> with that, I will turn the meeting over to Diane. Well, thank you. And thanks to George. Everyone at the Historical Society for pulling this together. It's really great to see such a crowd. And it's um, really important that the Historical Society just does great work to keep us all reminded of what came before us and inform us on what's to come in the future. So thank you, George. Um, I don't think Senator Lee, Leahy needs much introduction, 48 years in the Senate. Um, I think everybody's familiar with his Senate career, undoubtedly, but we've really come here today to talk about what his life was like growing up in Montpelier. And I know he doesn't need many prompts, but I've got a few prompts of my own here uh -oh. for him. <laughs> uh -oh. <laughs> Keep the conversation lively. And uh, you know, again, I'm not here as a journalist today asking tough questions. I'm here just in my sole role as having been um, uh, fortunate enough to be his staff member for 10 years and just to have a nice, fun conversation. I've promised him it would be fun. So I have to follow through on that. So. Um, for those who uh, have read the book, you might be you might uh, be familiar. The Road Taken, his opening chapter, starts with a scene out of the State House when he's four years old, being a little hellion riding his tricycle all over. And uh, I don't want to steal his thunder, so I'll have him tell that story. But I've asked him to start there and walk us through what the uh, early early memories are in growing up on State Street in Montpelier. 
<clears throat> well, thank you, Diane. And George, thank you. Your, uh, George Edson's parents were dear friends of my parents, and uh, it brings back memories just, just seeing him and hearing, hearing his voice. Uh, Mary and I and our late brother John grew up on 136 State Street and uh, almost diagonally across from the State House. So, you know, back in the days, you didn't even lock your doors. You walked around everywhere. Everybody knew everybody else. And one of my buddies and I decided, let's go explore the State House. We'd been there with my parents, but we had our tricycles and we went up and went in side door and nobody's around. So we dragged the tricycles up to the second floor and, <laughs> and uh, we're in a nice room, found out later is the Senate chambers. And we said, let's race down the halls. So we raced down the halls. Here's an open door. We go barreling through it, wham, up against this desk, which was 27 feet high, at least it looked to us. And a man leans over, he goes, yes. <laughs> and we said, hi, are you the governor? I am, now get out. <laughs> but he did give us some candy on the way out. <laughs> and uh, Mary, uh, you can imagine the reaction of our parents. We got home and I was all excited and I told my parents about this. They did not see the humor in it. <laughs> and uh, we weren't allowed to go in the state house without <laughs> the adults around. Uh, our current governor, uh, I was in there to meet with him not long after I be, became, a, uh, not long after he became governor, I was a U.S. senator. I come in, he says, it's a different desk, and don't bring your tricycle in here. <laughs> so beyond that, um, what other memories do you have on, on State Street itself a, as a kid? Um, and, and what was it like growing up in a family? You had the family business, the Leahy Press, in the back of the, of the building growing up. Um, maybe a few stories about Yeah, it, it was memories. interesting. We, we rented out rooms to legislators. My, my mother did and helped with, with the bills, but then I'd hear all these stories when they were in the house, which is wonderful. We rented out another apartment upstairs. But you could walk through the kitchen door into the Leahy Press. And the beauty of that, I, I learned to read at a very early age. I, one of the most formative things in my life. Can you hear this OK back there? Yeah, yeah. I, I can never tell from here. Uh, one of the most formative things I had my first library card at the Kellogg Harvard before I was five, and that's because I learned to read so so quickly in the uh, in the Leahy Press. We always had a constant stream, my parents had a constant stream of friends. We learned from them and hear all these stories and the history. Uh, my dad told the stories of the 27th flood and how he was there with his mother and his sister, which was long before my parents had met, and had moved up to the second floor of 136 State Street because the 27th flood was coming down State Street. The men uh, came up in a rowboat with a huge camera to the second floor. And Dad opened the window, let the guy into the place, tied the tied the roll boat to the cast iron uh, uh, radiator, thank you, and, uh, and helped him up onto the roof, passed up. The irony is I have a book with me, and I was glancing through it on the way over here. Marcel was driving, and there is a picture he took from that window. Wow. And you can see the house next door and what was the National Life Building. It's the state. Uh, office, but picture taken from up there. And, you know, you'd hear these stories. And then, of course, later on, we had Irene 
And that brought us from our home in Middlesex. The next day was a beautiful day. And flew around the state, saw everything was going on, and saw on the phone from the helicopter to Washington seeking aid for the... And, and I don't want to go too long, but I'll just close one thing. When this last flood came, and I'm watching on the news, and in buildings of different companies at the time, but buildings where I used to deliver newspapers, the Montpelier Argus, afternoon paper. I didn't want a morning paper. Uh, <laughs> but buildings where I delivered it, here the businesses in them destroyed. And I was literally in tears. I've never lost, even in the Senate and everywhere else we've lived, I've never really lost that feeling of growing up in Montpelier. Yeah. And, and, and I went to high school with this <laughs> building, as did my sister. She's much smarter. And, and our brother who was really smart. <laughs> So we want to talk a little about how your early um, experiences shaped how you know your career in the Senate. And your father was a real historian, um, knew everything, told these stories of the State House. You met the governor when you were four years old. How did these early experiences kind of shape you to get you uh, involved in politics? Well, I learned a couple of things from my parents. You know, my father had to leave school about 12 or 13 years old, when my grandfather was a stone carver in Barry, uh, Patrick J. Leahy, mm -hmm. died, and Dad had to go out and uh, support his mother and sister. And it was a different time. And I've never forgotten the stories. There'd be signs that say, no Irish need apply. Uh, or if you weren't smart enough to figure that out, <laughs> no Catholic did apply. And, uh, but Dad became a, a printer and eventually one of the best in the area and started his own printing business, Lay Press, which is still there. But he regretted not being able to finish school, but he became a self-taught historian. He read everything. He had a almost photographic memory of, of history. You get the Sunday newspapers and just devour them and talk about it. And so much so that our kids, when they were in college and they had a history exam coming, they'd call, let's call Grandpa Leahy and double check these, these answers. And that, that influenced me so much. Uh, now, my Italian mother, uh, my our grandparents emigrated to Vermont from Italy. She was born here, grew up speaking Italian. And that certainly influenced a feeling of diversity and, and why you need it. But the history, uh, and probably the thing without going too far off here, cherished the most. And my parents lived for a number of years after I got elected to the Senate and I could bring them to all these places that they'd read about. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember my dad holding handwritten notes, not copies, but the real ones that Abraham Lincoln had written down uh, in the archives in Washington. That was, that was a joy. And, but all the way through, I always felt I was kind of paying back what I had because Montpelier, you could walk everywhere, you could go anywhere. Half the time we'd leave our bicycles on the porch. and um, It was a different world. People helped each other. As I drove down here, I think of where, where the fires were. Uh, and Diane, I can't tell you, when you called me to tell me about the fires, how choked up I got hearing that. But some of the buildings along here, I can remember my parents going to the grocery store and the kids would be in the car and we'd pull up to obviously an area where people of limited means were living. And 
my dad opening the trunk, taking a bag of groceries up to the second floor, rickety stairways outside, knocking on the door. People would come to the door and hand him the groceries. And they'd say thank you, and he'd leave and get back in the car. Mm -hmm. Never told us who the people were. Uh, he just said, if people were in need, help them. Mm -hmm. And uh, <laughs> it, uh, it, it meant a lot. You touched a little bit on your library card at the age of four. <laughs> yeah. Um, maybe you also talk in your book a little bit about being in the supermarket, looking at comic books. You had only sight in one eye, and so reading became your passion. And maybe tell us a little bit about what did the Kellogg Hubbard Library look like when you were a four-year-old? I know the Leahy Wing wasn't built yet, so we can save that. <laughs> no, I, 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 I couldn't do that. I couldn't do that at the age of four. But uh, no, I was born basically blind in one eye. And so like you had severe macro degeneration with one eye. So sports were a difficult thing because of lack of depth perception. And... Um, that, uh, and actually that brought about the accident I had last year walking upstairs, but uh, reading, I only needed one eye. And we had a, and here's why individuals are important. I don't do any of you remember Mrs. Holbrook? Okay, I see a few hands go, good, thank you. <laughs> I'm not that old. But Mrs. Holbrook was the librarian the library was in the basement, and it was very, very small. But, and I went to St. Michael's grade school up on the top of the hill. I'd walk down the hill, go in the library. She said, well, Patrick, did you read the book you had a few days ago? Yes, I did, Ms. Silver. Tell me about it. And I, I would tell her. I said, good, now here's one by Mark Twain you might want to read or something. And I was, you know, like first, second grade. And by the end of third grade, I'd read all, all of Twain, all of Dickens, all of all these others, and history books, on, and she just kept encouraging, read, read these. And it was so enjoyable. And I know that when one of the floods here in Montpelier, when that was still there, people showed up from around the city, just ran in, grabbed all the books they could off the shelves, just ran out, threw them in their cars, and uh, to save them, otherwise they'd be destroyed. The flood was over, they brought out every single book, came back, plus about 20% more. <laughs> uh, now, when I... I've always felt that that was one of the most important things in my life. And my parents encouraged me to read. Um, it, after I got in the Senate, and I, I couldn't forget about that place. So I, the nice thing about being on appropriations committee, you get to determine where money goes. And they now have a beautiful, new wing for the children's library. Uh, and, well, I commend the architects and everybody else who put wood and stone both them together. But you can be somebody who has a reading problem or somebody who's reading several grades ahead of themselves and they have programs for you. Our grandchildren when they had come up to the farm during the summer, they would just go down. First thing they'd go down, they'd load up on books, and uh, we'd bring them back. We've uh, got at least one six-year-old in the audience who wants to hear a little about your Batman history. Um, well, couldn't, be a, <laughs> couldn't be a Senator Leahy talk without talking about Batman, so. Well, I, um, I did read Batman comics, <laughs> and uh, 10 cents. <laughs> Finally went to 12 says we would we would go in, I'd be there the first one at the store when the new came out. I tended to remember everything I read. And I do recall when I was in the Senate talking with people from 
DC Comics about legislation and something was said. I said, no, no, in 1947, uh, in a spring edition, about page five, such and such <laughs> happened. And they thought, yeah, we, we, we humor the guy. I said, oh, yes, sir, of course you're right. Look, what the hell is he talking about? It never happened. <laughs> go back in the archives and find They go back and they say, that's exactly what happened. And one thing led to another. I uh, worked with them on a very powerful, as we call a collector's item, Batman comic, because I was trying to uh, ban the export of landmines from the U.S. No country had done that. And when I started off, we, I could count about 12 votes in the Senate. Among the things we used was this Batman comic book, and several of us worked on it, including debating for two days the ending. It's a short story. Somebody worked for Wayne Industry in a combat area. Parents killed. Little girl was captured. Batman went and saved her. In the last panel, helicopter's coming to pick him up, and she said, look at the shiny toy. And he said, no, and then boom, and she's destroyed. And the reason we debated on that, and I went to every single senator across the political spectrum, I said, read that. And they said, okay, just leave us alone, we'll read it. And they said, that's a terrible ending. I said, there are no good endings in landmines. Marcel's a medical surgical nurse. She's been in war zones and in the uh, operating rooms and in the surgery places where they're having to uh, reamputate and to put prosthetics. So there's nothing happy. It's mostly civilians. And we passed the ban 100 to 0. The only controversial bill for 10 years. So I like I like Batman. <laughs> and and the, the kids seem to like it. I, I did reading hour. Uh, I, I volunteered reading hour one day, which is easy to come from our home in Middlesex on a Saturday in jeans and sweatshirt. And somebody hands me a note that Batman enemies had their pictures in the library. I could not figure out the clues. I I need help. I grab my phone. Are you nearby? Door opens a burst smoke in walks Batman. Now you can imagine these four, five, six year olds. Well, anyway, long story short, he couldn't figure out the clues, but the children did. And on the way out, he says, I want to thank you, children. You're you're welcome, Mr. Batman. It was fun. So we're going to open it up in a few minutes to questions, but I'm hoping before we do that... I'm getting out of sequence, I can, No, that's... I'm, I'm out of sequence. I'm hoping we can back it up a little bit just to get the visuals. What did downtown look like when you were a kid growing up? I, I talked to Mary a little bit in preparation, and she told me a little bit about the two supermarkets in town, the two competing downtown supermarkets, and... Um, yeah, I worked in then one. The, you worked in one, and, and I was maybe, a meat cutter. <laughs> just tell us a little bit about that and the visuals of downtown when well, you were a kid growing up. That 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 store is no longer there. In fact, there was a fire that destroyed that that wing, and then um, uh, the city center. Ben and Jerry's. Yeah, the city center building. Yeah, location. And, but yeah. Uh, it was a part-time job when I was in high school. And I learned two things. One, I learned how to carve meat. But secondly, I learned this is hard work. And I had a lot more, I think I had respect anyway for people who worked in stores like that, but I had even more realizing how, how hard the work was to do it right. And, and the difference in People come into the store, some very nice, some not so nice. But you you learn you learn that and you learn you should treat everybody with respect. And uh, so as part of growing up, most of the stores, we knew the people, we knew the people who ran the stores. Uh, 
I had to deliver printing there from the Lee Press. Uh, <coughs> usually on the way to school, drop off this such and such a, a place. And uh, it, it was different. You, know, you had Tuttles, you had all these others. Everybody knew everybody. Yeah. And uh, it, uh, I mean, I saw him deliver a newspaper. Oh, your, your mother was just in here. And uh, uh, she forgot this, be sure and bring it to her, or whatever it might be. It was a different world there. Uh, you, you tended not to judge people. I mean, it's a lot different than with my father as a 13 year old when there were uh, religious prejudices and others. That had diminished substantially. Uh, and I remember we used to joke about uh, mom and dad being the, the Democrats. Well, that's where the Democrats live over there in, the, in that house. But Dean Davis. Was Mr. Republican lived uh, and was president of National Life, lived across the street. He and his wife would come in and uh, play bridge with my parents at least one one night a week. Uh, George Edson, who had introduced me, his uh, father, Lionel, and mother, Isabel, they would, our parents would play bridge at their house one night, they played bridge at ours. You know, everybody knew everybody and socialized, and but helped each other. Say to my mother, where are you going? Uh, where are you going with that food? Well, so and so sick, and um, I just thought I might help out. And I said, well, who are they? Well, I don't really know them, but their friends is so and so. Mm -hmm. And so my friend brought supper last night, I'm bringing it tonight. Mm -hmm. And you know, you grow up in a, in a community like that, that's gonna affect you for the rest of your life, no, no matter what you do. I didn't expect to be a US Senator, but it, uh, I tried not to forget the things I learned. And so Montpellier has been special. And I, as Marcel knows, when I watch <clears throat> the news of the flood here uh, this year, I literally sat there in tears. Does Montpelier still feel familiar to you, uh, you know, having grown up here, or does it feel different as? Just the landscape, the yeah. look of the place. Well, the landscape is, is much the same. Uh, and we we used to, when I'd have, you know, I had an office here in Montpelier as a senator in that <laughs> terrible looking <laughs> post I, office building. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to say what I call it, Marcel. <laughs> uh, 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 uh. I think uh, I've heard about this, yes. <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't, don't but uh, we drive back to our home in, in Middlesex. I usually go up, uh, you know, up, up the hill and go over past what we call Codyville yep. and uh, into into Middlesex in the back road. And so much of that's always looked like. But the the people I knew then, not nowhere near as much. I mean, they could. I grew up with the, the high school class I was in was only 30 or 40. Is that right, Maxie? 25 to 30. Hmm? Just 25 to 30. And, and the sad thing was that more than 10% of the class was dead within a few months after graduation. Several in an automobile accident. And another one, uh, one of my classmates, it got it joined the military uh, and the paratroopers and the parachute did not open. No. Uh, I, every time I parachuted, I thought of that. 
Well, I think on that note, we can open it up for a little Q&A from the audience. We've got Catherine with the microphone here. Oh, or George, sorry, George. Um, right, now you, are, you understand with both Catherine and George, I wanted to really date myself, but Mary and I knew their parents. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and they were such here. good people growing up. We'll just bring the microphone over, maybe. Yeah, Thank you. you I do have a question, Senator, but first, uh, our, my parents and yours were friends also. I'm Stan Sloan. Is that microphone oh. on? Is it? Okay. Hold it close. Hold it closer. Okay. Is that okay? Yep. And subsequently, I worked for the Congressional Research Service on international yeah. affairs and did work for you and your staff as well. Thank you. But my question, and I delivered the free press. I have one of those morning <laughs> routes going up East State Street in the I've winter. I've never been a morning person. <laughs> <laughs> no, I wouldn't do it again. So I, I would rather have the Argus route. No question about that. But my question is, what values do you think that you came away from growing up in Montpelier that, that influenced the way that you acted as a, sen as a U.S. senator? Because I know that I, I took away a lot of important values that are still important to me today, and I'm sure you did as well. I'd like to hear exactly how you see that. Well, thank you. It's a good question. I think the values continue at all levels of life. Uh, when I was state's attorney in Chittenden County, I was on call seven days a week, 24 hours a day. You don't see that today. Uh, several nights a, a week, I'd be out at two or three o'clock in the morning with the police, and I'd see what happened when people did not treat people the way they should. And I thought back to where growing up in Montpelier where people tried to help each other. Um, when I went in the Senate, I realized the worst thing could do is to automatically catalog somebody. Uh, people talked about that when I was chair and, and when I was vice chair of uh, the Appropriations Committee, the close relationship I have with Dick Shelby Alabama, we're poles apart philosophically. About the only thing we have in common is this, we're the two of the biggest people in the in size in the Senate. But we always kept our word to each other. And we always worked things out. And we always said, well, what's the bottom line going to be to the people who are affected by it? And we were talking about this just the other night, Marcel, when I, when I called Dick just to check on how his wife was doing it. Uh, so I think these are the things I learned I try to carry with me. And the fact that it came from a, a small town, uh, people would call us by our first name. They uh, would say, oh, great to see you. I saw your sister last week, or I uh, saw your cousin, or whatever it might be. And you realize this is real life. Maybe the best way to answer is I grew up in a real life. Some of the people, and this is why there's been such deterioration, the Senate and especially in the House of Representatives, <coughs> people grown up in a make-believe, go for the that moment's headline, life. And that's not, that's not America. Did you feel the same way about? Sorry. Did you feel the same way about growing up here? I do. I, I feel uh, I grew up with a sense of community. Grab the mic, okay? Thanks. Okay. <laughs> I grew up with a sense of strong community, respect for other people, and as you pointed out, not prejudging people and understanding that there are things going on in their life that may be influencing what they're doing and what they're saying. And it's always important to look at that. And in Washington, I didn't see that that uh, always happened. No. <laughs> you, I, I couldn't say it better than you just did. <laughs> Questions? Huh? 
Senator, I realize you're probably younger than this, but I wonder if you ever had a chance to ride on the Montpelier to Wells River Railroad. Oh, damn. <laughs> I guess that's a yes. <laughs> my, uh, as I said, when my, I, I didn't know my paternal grandparents because they both passed away before my parents even met. But my maternal grandparents immigrated from Italy, and we still have a lot of relatives there. And settled in South Reigate. My grandfather was a stone carver, and he and his brother uh, started the Zambone Stone Shed. And as kids, we'd sometimes go over uh, to visit our um, uh, grandparents for a few days. We get on the train right out here, and uh, my folks would put me on the train. They, the conductor knew who we were and said, don't, don't worry, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Leahy, they'll, I'll get them off. We drive in South Ragate. There was a stop there. My grandfather uh, would be there and he'd say, Mr. Zambon, I got your grandchildren here. Oh, molto grazie. And uh, he'd take us off. We, I no, no, and wave goodbye. I mean, what else you do on a train? <laughs> it was, uh, uh, since then, I've taken the train a lot between New York and Washington, Washington, Philadelphia. It's a little bit different, uh, but uh, that and we've um, we've had grandchildren up here. It, it had such memories that we have several times taken our grandchildren. We've gotten on the train in Waterbury and ridden down to uh, White River, got down to White River. Somebody from my office would meet us there. We'd have lunch go to the Montshire and drive back to, to Middlesex. Those kids still talk about it years later doing it. It's, uh, it's a special way to see, to see Vermont. Don, yes, thank you for being here. Um, I imagine that being a senator might be a little stressful. <laughs> And I wonder, <laughs> just talk. I'm Patty, Casey. Um, I'm just wondering what you do to take care of yourself to stay so vigorous. I'm fortunate that I married way above myself. <laughs> uh, I married a compassionate, intelligent, wonderful registered nurse. We had to wait until she finished nursing school before we could get married because somebody had to have a job. I, I was a law student. And, uh, but she has gone all over the world with me. We've done things together. We've had uh, watched raising children, spending time with grandchildren, caring for her mother for years in her later life, uh, and learn about human beings. Now, um, I'll tell you a secret. Don't tell her I told you this. <laughs> but when we first started dating, she and her parents would only speak French at home. And I had to dramatically improve my French so I could understand what they were saying about me. <laughs> Is that right? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I think that being able to come back home, I was home several times a month. And the nice thing is it's not that long a flight from Washington during the time I was in the Senate. And I'd get to see people in the grocery store, pick up my newspaper, do whatever I was doing. And people would stop and talk. And you realize what you're hearing from people in a store and walking down the street might be a lot different than what you're hearing on pundits on national television from the right or the left. And uh, that helped keep me, uh, keep me anchored. I think, I know I've had different senators who have come up here in both parties and uh, stay with us at the farm and go around. And every one of them has said, this is different than my state. And I take that as a compliment. Uh, 
because of the way we could be. And even when I was president pro tem, and I'd walk around with this entourage of armed guards because you're third in line to the presidency, uh, there was only one time that I was really glad to have when I was here in Vermont. <laughs> and <laughs> that was, I was in St. Johnsbury. And this little guy comes up to me, and he says, Pat, do you remember me? I said, I'm sorry, I don't. He said, well, we met before. And I said, well, when? He said, 1974. And I said, well, I wasn't in the Senate in 74. I was state's attorney. Hey, I, and you threw my ass in jail. <laughs> and I've been, I've been wanting to talk to you about it. Now, I had an airplane to catch. We're in St. Johnsbury, even with these guys, with their police guys. We were I said, I got to catch a plane. Oh, he said, I've been mean to talk to you. I'm thinking, if this guy's been mean to talk to me for 40 years, I don't want to talk to him. And one of the agents was a lot taller than I am, leans over. She said, why don't you talk with me? I got to come. I have no idea. But I, I felt like saying, you weren't the only person I prosecuted that was there for eight years. <laughs> I'll also just add this quick addition to that. I think you wake up very early in the morning and read every local paper in the state of Vermont, even when he was in DC, because I'd call him in the morning with some news because I was his eyes and ears for Montpelier for many years. And he'd already know it. There was nothing I could tell this man that he hadn't already read by 7 in the morning. So well, that kept him I, young, I think. I think Digger in Seven Days is so good at getting stuff out. And, and, and the other newspapers I can read online. Uh, I think local news is very important. And it's diminishing because of the cost and everything else. And you lose on that. Um, when, and I think it's, maybe that's one of the effects it's having in, in the Senate and the House, that they're interested in what's going to be on that 30-second bite mm -hmm. somewhere in national mm -hmm. news. Hi, yeah. Senator. Uh, can you hear me? Yep. OK. Um, my grandparents were sort of on different Hold the microphone the a little bit closer. Game. My grandparents were on different sides of the aisle during the uh, strikes in Barrie. My grandfather was the comptroller for the Rock of Ages. My grandmother was the cousin of the socialist mayor in <laughs> Barrie. Oh boy, that must have been fun at home. Well, they seem to get on OK, despite all that. And I'm just sort of wondering if you have any memories of that time. The other thing I remember is, like, I grew, I grew up more in New York, sort of back and forth between New York and Vermont. But in Vermont, there was a big competition between Barry and Montpelier. Montpelier was bad, and Barry was good. <laughs> that, that, that's how I understood well, it. And so anything you want to comment on. Well, the strikes, the strikes were before my time, but I do know that you go through one of the cemeteries in Barry, and you see a tombstone with Patrick J. Leahy on it. Now, some of my opponents have said, damn, wrong one. But uh, uh, that was my, that was my grand, grandfather. My father was born in Barrie. And uh, we always had friends in Barrie and, and Montpelier. Uh, my, grand, my Italian grandfather would come to Barrie and be with a lot of his friends for um, They'd have lunch in one of the, one of the restaurants. I forget what it was, but I was about six or seven years old. He'd bring me with him, and they'd be going in Italian, in French, English, and I just sat there and listened to him. And um, 
I had a lot of classmates here at St. Michael's who came here from Barry. So I, I never felt the uh, animosity between Barry and, and Montpelier. And I, and I could never understand it when I had been told about it. Oh. Thank Thanks. you. <laughs> Hello, Senator. My name is Liz Dodd, and I have moved here from Washington, D.C. about 42 years ago. <laughs> and my husband was Tom Dodd, and we've spoken about this before, and Tom was with WDEV, and he was a reporter for WDEV yep. for many years. But I wonder now, given everything that this wonderful community has been through in the last few in the last year particularly, in the last few months, what advice you have that you in the wonderful career that you have and the wonderful giving person you are, any advice that you have about how we might best get through what we have to deal with in coming through where we're at now? Any suggestions? Uh, of course, WDV, we knew well because Lady Press did the printing for WDV and Lloyd Squire, as a little kid, I knew Lloyd Squire and his wife would come into their uh, house in Waterbury. She'd be making cookies or donuts. And it was kids, we thought, boy, that's really, that, that radio station is important. We're getting hot, hot cookies here. But, um, uh, we sometimes forget how small our state is. And there's some trends that bother me. Our graduation rate from high school is diminishing. Too many of our young people are leaving the state and we are, uh, the ages, the average age is going up. Uh, I worry about those who say, well, do we want to bring this business or not? We want to bring businesses that require an educated workforce and then make sure we have the education and we push for it. We've seen this in some of the uh, uh, places like in Essex Junction. I, I know some people are worried that they might want too much parking for this um, electric airplane, electric helicopter they're making in Burlington. I look at the, what they're paying the people who have to have all kinds of education again, and I'm thinking, build a parking lot if you want. You need these people. They're the ones going to buy homes. They're the ones who are going to raise their children. Uh, we have got to have more emphasis on the education of our young younger people. And, but then we've got to have the jobs that appeal to them. Uh, there will always be minimum wage jobs. I understand that. But we've got to ask that we can hold out to them and say, you graduated from high school. You learned this. Maybe you go to a trade school, whatever you do, or to college. We'll find ways to pay for it. But there'll be jobs available and jobs in Vermont. If we don't, I worry about Vermont. Uh, I felt very privileged, especially my last 20 years or so in the Senate because of my seniority. Uh, we could get money for things. When COVID hit, I remember calling the governor and said, I put it in a small extra appropriations under the Leahy small state minimum. He said, oh, how much? I said, a billion, 500 million. It was a pause. He said, you say billion? Well, I said, don't forget the 500 million also. <laughs> he said, how'd you do that? It helps to be chair of the committee. But the, uh, but I, I wanted to do that because we could have been devastated with COVID. We could have been devastated in the next generation. We could be devastated in the generation my age. I mean, I was going to have fine medical care. Marcel was going to have... A lot of people in Vermont were not, and we wanted to get that money out here and protect our state. But then we have got to encourage the younger generation that there will be things here for them and work to have jobs for them and work to have things they can do. 
uh, global foundries in Essex Junction. I, I was concerned when people, some people oppose legislation to fund them. Where do you want to build these chips? In China? I want to build them here in the United States. And if we're going to build them in the United States, let's do it states alphabetically, starting with V-E-R-M-O-N-T. <laughs> Uh, Senator Leahy, I'm curious, uh, George Edson here is, one, uh, is kind of our NC, and I'm wondering if you have any reflections or remembrances of his father's Landel's C.H. Uh, Cross Bakery. Oh, I do. I, I also delivered newspapers there, and uh, I love the smell of, of coming in, and I would get uh, the D'Arthony's, Norman D'Arthony worked there and others, but I'd come in and uh, and talk, deliver the newspapers. I remember fresh food. We, when you grow up with an Italian mother, you like you get used to home baked things, and this was uh, cross baking was as close to home baking as we could. But I also saw the pride the people took in in the. Uh, uh, in cross banking. And I think, um, George, I think your father really instilled that in them and encouraged them in that. So I, it's the kind of thing that made Montpelier special. Patrick, I have a question. Uh, tell us about your neighborhood. Uh, what did you do as kids? And do you remember the Montpelier curfew? <laughs> I remember that. <laughs> You knew when the curfew was. And what was it? T ten minutes of nine or ten minutes of nine? Now, how's that for memory? Uh, but um, the curfew was suggestive, recommended. Uh, but I think our parents liked it because told us to get home. We had friends. State Street did not have many families on around where we were. Uh, our friends were up the hill or other places, and uh, it reminded us to come home for our friends' houses or for them to go home from uh, from ours. Uh, my sister was Barbara D. Anthony and. Others would, you know, you, but you get used to play with it. Well, in fact, down the street from us, on the other side of the street, was a big open lot. Um, they had a, a softball diamond there. Uh, people would, would play uh, all kinds of sports there, run. We'd go up, a lot of us would go up to Hubbard Park. We'd climb up the walk up behind the state house, go on up. Uh, we'd go sledding in the park in the wintertime. We'd climb up there, climb up the tower. You know, that 3,000-foot-high tower when you're <laughs> five years old. And uh, uh, and then they had a whole area, I don't know if they still do, where you cook out. Uh, first yeah. come, first serve. Fireplace. It, it'd be so many families uh, there. It was, you knew families. Uh, you knew which door was never locked. <laughs> and, and uh, but you also knew you had to behave yourself, mostly. <laughs> I behaved myself. I worried about my brother and sister, but. <laughs> I gotta look. My sister was listening. Yes, sir. Senator, it's good to see you again, especially in this capacity. You did good things, you do good things, and you continue to do good things. I don't have a question, but I'll sit down quickly after this comment. <clears throat> I said you do good things. My wife and I arrived here in the States in 40, going on 40 years, and what you represent 
is one of the reasons that we're still here. I said you do good things. The fact is, uh, in church this morning, the pastor kept saying, thank you, God, thank you, God, thank you, God. <clears throat> I don't think God would mind if I said, thank you, Senator, thank you, Senator, thank you, Senator. <laughs> and as I close, I'm looking around as I hear you talk about values from human values, family values, vision. And as I look around here, I see one or two youngsters. And it is good that they're hearing you. I spoke to Elizabeth here to my right. And she was, I, my question was, is this your first of a series of interactions? I don't know. However, I do hope it's not your last as you go across this state. Our young people need to hear you. You're an icon or whether you want to call it a, mo a role model, et cetera. You and the Mrs. Senator, <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's factual. They need to hear that. <clears throat> I read about your being here today in the seven days. And I said, I'm going to be wearing a suit tomorrow because I'm going to church. And afterwards, I'm going to keep on that suit because I'm going to hear a person who continues to make a difference in our society, in our human family. Our kids need to hear that. I'm active, that is, I participate very actively in our school board meeting there in, Frank, in Fairfax. And the adults, some of the adults who come, bring some very negative and provocative stuff. And I've heard more than one student at that school shush some of the adults because the adults are not bringing some, a percentage, but a distinct percentage of bringing verbiage that's not good, either for the students or our teachers or administrators, etc. Again, I say, the body us as a state, to say nothing about the nation and foreign stuff, <clears throat> needs people like you to be. You're doing good things. You'll do more. There's a scripture that says in gospel that we are expected to do more and greater things. Your presence encourages people to do that. Your profile encourages people to the reality that it can be done. And I thank you again. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Sir, that means, that means so much to me. Because you can only do your best on things and It is not always the easiest. I mean, there's all the luxurious trapping of being in the Senate. As the dean of the Senate, I have the nicest rooms and all that. But that's not what the Senate is. The Senate is how you act, what you do for the country. It, do you follow your conscience? And one of the reasons I like coming home so much, that people like you, now there's what we do in me. It's not, it's not about me, it's about all of us. And uh, it means people com coming together. I think of the battles that we still had in segregation when I first came there. I remember talking to people like Hubert Humphrey who talked about how he fought that. I think of... Um, two of our granddaughters, one white, one black, walking down the street here in Montpelier. The white granddaughter lives here. She was asked, well, who's this? She said, my sister. <coughs> and <coughs> I don't think I could have done 48 years or done the things I'm most proud of if I couldn't come back to Vermont. And Marcel and I talked about this when 
few years ago, we were basically make up our mind not to run again, even though I knew I could be reelected. And we wanted to come back here. Uh, we were both born in Vermont. Our roots are here. We believe in Vermont values. And so we came back. And uh, the reasons for coming back, we see every time we're going to the grocery store, walking down the street uh, to, to get a paper or whatever we're doing. We run into people and we hear it at all ages, all, all in, income levels, all everything. And we just hear the reasons why we come here, including people who agree or disagree with me on, on issues. We can at least discuss it. And I watch how the House and Senate have degenerated. Uh, people forgetting they have an oath to the Constitution. They have an oath to respect all of us. And they're not. They're respecting their own individual uh, advancement or whatever else. And that's wrong. That, one thing I pray for, that that will change. And we made our first trip back to Washington a couple of weeks ago. Two or three days running into some of my friends I was pleased to hear those who want it to change. I'm distressed at those who don't want it to. And that's a terrible mistake for our country. We're a good country. We have good values, but we have to fight to keep those values. And when children go to school, they have to be taught those values, real values, not sloganeering. And they have to, I'm thankful, I'll stop with this, I'm thankful the times when I finally realized why my parents stopped on the way home after leaving the grocery store, climbed up those rickety stairs, knocking on the door, leaving a bag of groceries. And I think of all the, well, you know, we're, we're saying the same thing. <laughs> it's keep our values as Vermonters. I wish the heck the rest of the Congress would. And your teacher's going to get the final word. I had not planned this, believe me. What, what grade was it, Maxine? I had you twice a day, every school day for a whole year. What, 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 what grade? Senior, hmm? you were a senior. Yeah. Chemistry and sociology. And why you are still here after that chemistry class, I do not know. <laughs> well, I decided I, not to become a chemist. <laughs> what I knew about chemistry was mighty little, but I was one of the Sisters of Mercy, and you went and taught what you were told to go teach. And you were the first class I had for chemistry. <laughs> and it's a miracle, and I'm not religious anymore, but it's a miracle you're here. <laughs> well, it's a miracle this building is still here because that, we didn't blow it up. That's right. That's right. Now, I want to ask you, do you have any good memories of your time in this building? And this, of course, was the gymnasium without that ceiling. Yeah. And do you have any that you'd like to share with us. Just, just seeing my friends walking in, you know, we'd walk from, from home, I'd walk home for lunch, uh, sometimes down the railroad tracks, but uh, it, you know, just, just seeing friends and talking with them. I didn't spend that much time in gymnasium because with my lack of depth perception, I wasn't any good at, the, although I did have one fun with this thing. We had, Oh, what was the coach's name? Sheridan? Yes. <laughs> uh, and Roger Sheridan, my, Mary, just reminded me. Roger Sh Sheridan was a good sized person. And they named me, I was over six feet tall by the time I was a freshman in high school. 
and they named me the manager of the team. So Coach Shard and I would drive to a town we probably hadn't played before, but we'd go there and set things up. And we'd walk in and everybody would look at me and say, what position do you play? I said, I was too short to make the team. <laughs> I know it's a little bit of a lie, bless me, Father, uh, but it sure had an effect on me. Okay. Thank you all for coming. Thank you, Senator Leahy. Thank you, Diane Jerry. Yeah, I, I want to thank Diane because Diane has worked hard on this, so thank you all. This, uh, this, this part is...